uh, praise and worship team still on Wednesday night at 7, Sunday school, worship time, everything's the same. Uh, prayer request. Jake and Doyle's son, uh, Pastor Wayne and Donna, Tiffany Riley and the boys, uh, Hannah, Pastor Bob and his wife Hazel are from California, and I guess they're moving up here eventually, and they've been checking out different churches in the area, and it sounds like they're going to be coming here. So uh, October, is that what you said? They're thinking about being up here, so we want to pray for their smooth transition and safe travels. Uh, Joe and Kim are going to be part of this book extravaganza for their icon group. And that's a bunch of local writers that come together, and it's at the Caldwell Public Library uh, this Saturday? The 24th. Um, over 95 different books. So if you're a reader, some of them are fiction, some of them are Christian. They have a pretty good variety of different kinds of books there. So if you're not doing anything between 1030 and 4 on Saturday, you may want to go down to the Caldwell Public Library and Give them a hug and maybe check out some of their books down there. Uh, Boise Rescue Mission, we took the last load over to them, and they've got a new list now that we're going into winter time. They're starting to look for more of the uh, warm stuff, <laughs> sweaters and, and jackets. and you, you can see the list there in your bulletin. Uh, Sarah's School. Still have some needs there. If you take a moment and look at that, we like to help the schools. We know that the teachers can't afford to do it all on their own, and anymore the school system just doesn't supply what the teachers need. So if the Lord lays that on your heart, I want you to be praying about that as well. Okay, any birthdays? I, it's not my birthday, but I have praise. Oh, okay. That's great. We need to support our youth in this. That, that's a great idea. Thank you. Anybody have anything else they wanted to bring up? Uh, Kids Club starts October 6th. And that's coming up soon. October 6th, the first night at Kids Club. Not only be praying for the kids, but the leaders. <laughs> have you ever been involved with that? It gets kind of hectic sometimes. So uh, definitely be in prayer for them. Anything else that anybody else wants to bring up? Okay, back to birthdays. Anybody have a birthday that we need to recognize? How about anniversaries? No birthdays and no anniversaries? Wow. You remember that there is a Hemp Sink night at 6.30, so let's have come. 6.30, Hemp Sink. And they're going to have cookies, right? Okay, Riley, you hear that? They're going to have cookies. Okay, so you're going to be okay with cookies. You'll have something to eat. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Old Fashioned Hymn Song, there are a group of people from several different denominations that have joined together, and they sing songs out of the hymnals that we may not sing very often. And it's really a good time of fellowship, especially with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ from different denominations that you may not rub elbows with all the time. So it, it's really kind of exciting. It, it's a neat time, especially if you like those old hymns, like I do. I don't know about you, George, but I, I, I like them. <laughs> but that's tonight at 6.30. Thank you, Joe. I skimmed right past that. Anything else? I forgot. Okay, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend in your house and worship you, dear Lord. We uh, thank you for bringing Pastor and Joe and Chris and Nikki and the kids back from their vacation and Hope they got fully rested so we can put them back to work again. But, dear Lord, we just ask that you uh, be with those that aren't feeling so well this morning, uh, that have needs. Uh, uh, Sandy was saying her husband, J.D., is doing better. He's not over it yet. But we have others, you know, that we need to keep in mind as we're, we're lifting them up in prayer for healing. And I see Diane's not here this morning either, dear Lord, and put your hand upon her. We just ask that you uh, be with us and fill us with your love. And be with Pastor as he brings the morning message. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, kids, you can go.
Well, good morning. Everybody asked if we had a, a restful trip. I went with my mother-in-law. Nice. Need I say any more, gentlemen? You know, my mother-in-law, I was really worried about this trip because, like I was telling Sunday school class, she's kind of a control freak, kind of. But I realized that I'm kind of a control person. But you know what? We did well. Well, I'm working on it. I'm not convinced that she's working on it. I, you know what? I've, I, love, I loved the week that we had together. Good to meet, meet some people that I haven't met before. The, the Lord blessed me with. I good to see my son. And I good to meet, well, probably... I want to be careful because I have so many of them, but probably the best looking granddaughter in Astoria anyway, you know, so in uh, Magnolia and um, she is a spitting image of Juniper and Juniper has turned into a beautiful young <laughs> little four year old. Woo! Just uh, we just had so much time. The Lord really did bless me. Now the rest part. The first we get to Camas, uh, um, Washington, and I thought they would have hotels there. My mother-in-law picked the hotel room, and she felt a little bad because she landed up having us go to Vancouver, Washington. I didn't realize that Joellen and I drove through Vancouver all the time going to see JJ, but we were in Vancouver, Washington at the mall in a hotel room. And I'm usually not afraid to go outside after the sun goes down. Anywhere. But after my first night in Vancouver, Washington, at the hotel room by the mall, man, I went upstairs, I stayed upstairs. There were things going on out there that didn't... I, I expected our car to be vandalized. I'm not joking. I was, I was out there and uh, I was just getting ready to go back up to the room. <coughs> and these two people drive by. <coughs> Excuse me on a bike, and the one person is holding these big old bolt cutters. <laughs> this, this is, uh, anyway, I told you all the next time we do this, we'll pick the hotels. It's amazing what 20 extra dollars will get you. We had a great time. Thank you for letting us do that. Thank you. Paul's not here, but thank you for loving Paul. I understand he's a great preacher. He, he's sought after. He preaches a bunch of other churches, so um, we just, uh, I felt pretty privileged to have them, have them, have them fill in. You know, um, I'm going to just go ahead, and we are on week four of a mission, of Made for a Mission, and today's, uh, today's topic is, is, who is my mission? But before we get into that too much, I just want to, what I really love about the pastor who put this series together is he opens up with his little stories to begin with. I, I know you guys were hoping that this was stuff that I did, but <laughs> not so much that smart. He says, I'll be honest that when I would see her walking down the street, I made it a point to look down. I had judged her and made snickering remarks at her expense on more than one occasion. It wasn't just me. It was all the guys. What did she expect? I didn't make the choices she made. I didn't run from one relationship to the next like they were a blowout sale on Black Friday. It wasn't like it was all the time. She mostly kept to herself or her, or her flavor of the month husband or boyfriend. It's not like when we'd pass, she'd say hi to me either. That's why it was crazy this one day when she raced into the center of town yelling for people to come with her. What had gotten into her? Where did this sudden urgency come from and this boldness to call out everyone in her path to follow her? Um, out of sheer intrigue, I guess, I decided to join the crowd and follow this woman we'd spent the past decade intentionally avoiding. 
She brought us out to the well where we got our um, water each morning. But it was who was standing next to it that made her so excited. Okay, okay, everybody. This is Jesus. He's the man I was telling you all about. He told me everything I ever did and have, and have words of eternal life. Just listen to him, okay? The woman said as she moved out of the way to give this very ordinary looking man center stage. And then he began to speak and it was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Someone brought up the paralyzed son and Jesus put his hand on the kid's legs and he jumped up and started walking. The place was going crazy and my heart was beating out of my chest. That day, I gave my life to Jesus. And he's the best thing that ever happened to me. I think to myself often, what if she never told us? What if she invited me to meet? What if she didn't invite me to meet him myself? I don't look down when I pass anymore on the road anymore that's pretty telling of my life how I know that I can be toward people who our society has deemed not right who our society has deemed uh, you know underprivileged or uh, you know whatever you want to call it they're not like me pretty easy for me to snub my nose uh, and you know, my experience in the church the last 20 some years has been I'm not alone. Um, you know, like I said, today we're in week four of our Made for a Mission series. Um, if you're here for the first time or missed some of the past three weeks, let's do a quick review. I believe review is how we learn. Review, 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 review. Um, all right, so let's go here. Well, maybe. Why is this thing always killing me? Is there nobody anybody back there? Are you going to get off your phone and help me? <laughs> I need you to go to the next slide. There we go. Ooh, let's review. How about one more? Okay, week one, we said that we are all called. If you are here today and you are a born again child of God, if you've had this experience that this fellow here is talking about, then guess what? You're called. You're called. Remember, all of us are called. The Lord just did not save us because he wants to have a whole bunch of people up in heaven. I think he does want to have a bunch of people up in heaven, but he's given us while we're here a job to do. Okay, now I don't want to confuse that with Galatians. It's not that we have to work our way to heaven. I am a firm believer is that, that I am saved by, by faith and by grace. And you know what? That anything that I do on behalf of the Lord is because I'm saved. Not so I can stay saved. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, and I hope that that's your heart with it too. We, we don't come to church so we can stay saved. We don't give to the Boise Rescue Mission so we can stay saved. We, we come to church because the Bible tells us to. We give to the Boise Rescue Mission because the Bible tells us to. And not, not because we won't be saved if we don't, but because God loves these people. God loves us. He knows that there's strength. There's all these things here that, that we, we can uh, bless each other with. But, uh, but, but anyways, we, we love Him. That's why we do these things. It's, I don't do these things to get, to get saved. Um, anyways, I believe that we were all called. Next! Okay. Hey, you know what, buddy? If you put that cursor thing on... Okay. Then don't touch it. <laughs> Week two, we asked the question, what's my mission? What is my mission? Now, I, I've sh I shared my testimony uh, the week three <coughs> with everybody. But what was our mission? And, and what I really believe our mission is, is Jesus says, because if we're called, okay, that, makes, that means that we're disciples, correct? Are we disciples? And Jesus said himself. It wasn't Paul. It's not Pastor Dallas. It's nobody, man. But Jesus said, it, to, if you are my disciple, or to be my disciple... 
You will deny yourself. Okay? You will pick up your cross and listen to what he says. You will follow me. Not me. Him. Follow him. Follow him. That is our goal. That is what our mission truly is. Is to deny ourselves. Now, you know, we could sit up here for, for, for five weeks in just that one passage and still not dig all that's in there. What does that mean? Deny myself. Pick up your cross and follow him. You know, what I'm getting out of it is that Jesus had, had something on his mind. He won't go do it. If the Lord puts something on your heart and on your mind, we need to be courage, cor courageous enough and bold enough and trust Him enough to go do it. To go do it. Not so you can stay saved. Because, but because remember what Jesus said in John 14? He says, hey, if you love me, you'll obey me. Man, my whole ministry, I've heard people tell me who are sinning and keep finding their lives in a bad way. Well, I know God loves me. Well, I'm never going to deny you. You know what? Charles Manson, God loved. God loved Hitler. That's as hard to, to say to some people and even harder to hear for others. But it's true. The question isn't whether God loves us. Romans says that even when we were in our sin and hated him, he still sent his son to die for you. How much love is that? The question is this. Do you love him? Okay, do we love him enough to obey him, to follow him, even if it means, even if it means, Joel, and that you're not going to be able to stay in Gillette, Wyoming, even if it means that we, we uh, you know, had to come to Sand Hollow, <laughs> you know, are we willing to follow him? A true disciple of Jesus will do that. They die to themselves. This isn't about me and Joel. Okay. They'll pick up their cross. What does that mean? What does that mean? Pick up your cross. Jesus, he, he died on a cross for you and for me. And I think that what he's telling us is expect to die. Expect to die for his sake. There is one, there's one of the 12 apostles who didn't get martyred. John. Okay, all the rest of them, guess what? They got martyred. They, got, they died. Be willing to do that. Now, fortunately, I don't believe that God asked everybody to go into the, to the backwoods of Africa where people, where you have a chance of being headhunted. Okay? But you know what? He does expect us in our influence, in our sphere, in, our, in, in the life He has us to love Him and trust Him enough and to be willing to put our own comforts aside and being willing to say, hey, if he was willing to go to the cross for me, I need to be willing to go to the cross for these other people. We need to live that way. That needs to be our heart. Not my words. His. That is our mission, church. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. And follow him. It doesn't mean that we follow him just to the football games. Or to the super nice hotel rooms. Or all the, we might have to follow him. To where the headhunters are. We might have to do some things that uh, he requires. And, and, uh, and, and we need to be willing to do it. You know, I have here for, for 15 years t um, in Timothy, or in James. James 1.21 and 122, it tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because the people who only listen to the word and don't do it are deceived. I don't want you guys to be deceived. I don't want to be deceived. Okay? I want every one of you people that are hearing my voice today, one day to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Just being hearers of the word ain't going to get that done. We got to be doers of the word. Anyways, that's what our mission is. Week two. Okay? Week three. We answered the question, what's my message? And I'm going to go through this real quick. Listen, our message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's your message. That's my message. 
my message to, to you is with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, how it has impacted my life forever. How, how that message, me receiving that message, has changed the whole family tree. Okay? That's your message too. And I hope that you're here today and you have one. That you know exactly what Jesus has saved you from and saved you to. And, and, and I pray that you will, will, will become bold enough when the time is right, to tell somebody who needs to hear it, there's hope. You know? There, this is such a cliche, and it's so... <coughs> I think it's a cliche. Jesus saves, look at me. This is what the hippies used to say. Jesus saves, look at me. Well, I'm standing up here today, and if you'd have known me 25 years ago, and I said, Jesus saves, look at me, you would go, something saved him. He is different. He thinks different. He acts different. He has, con he has the C word, compassion. Kind of. Working on it. That's, that's our message. Is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the message of San Hollow Baptist Church. Okay? It's, it's the message that Jesus Christ loves you. John 3.16, what we teach our kids. Guess what? It's for you too. It's for you too. I leave these blocks up here from VBS because we want our kids to understand the ABCs of being a Christian. Okay, you admit, uh, believe, and confess. Okay, listen, that's just not for the children. That's for you and for me. That's the message. That's how people who are hopeless can possibly have, find hope in Jesus Christ. And guess what? Their family tree changes. That's my message, anyway. Everybody asks me about my church, my church, my church. So my church is filled up with a bunch of hypocrites and sinners, just like the pastor. Okay? Someone told me one time, well, I don't want to go to church. It's just full of hypocrites. Well, look around. I try to tell them, no, man, we got room for a few more. <laughs> Come. And let him change you. Let him change you. Grasp the message. I had a young man tell me one time, well, I think that I'm going to walk away from the, from the Lord for a while and go live out in the world so when I come back, I'll have a testimony. No, 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 no. You, you, you not going out and living in the world, being raised for mom and dad and, and not having to experience all that, that is the testimony. That is the testimony. That, in fact, you can take that back to the Bible. The Bible says that in the Old Testament, he says, you know what? God is going to bless a thousand generations for those who love me. And I'm going to curse 10,000 generations of those who don't. You could be breaking that, that curse. You know what you really are is somewhere along the line, this is what I give credit to. I had a grandma, a great grandma, probably somebody I never met, praying, praying and loving God. And all God is doing by allowing me to be a part of his kingdom is fulfilling his promise to her. Maybe that's what you're here for. That is a testimony. Okay? I think we need to know our, have, have, our, have our testimonies figured out. We should be able to articulate them. Um, what has God done? For, you know, what was life like before? What, is, uh, what happened? Do you have an encounter? And what's life like now that you have the Lord? That's your testimony. People need to hear it. I know there's a lot of people on the radio saying, no, nope, that's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. Well, that's how, that's how, that's how it's done. Okay? How are people going to know if somebody doesn't tell them? How, how are the people in your life who need to hear this going to know if you don't tell them? Okay? Um, anyways, let's move on to today. Hey, good. way to pay attention, buddy. Who is my mission? Is what we're going to talk about today. And, uh, and, and so, to make a long story short, there's 22 pages of this message here. But now that's mostly because it's like on 20 font. So I can read it. <clears throat> we learned, uh, listen, today what we're going to learn is that everybody is our mission. Everybody is our mission. Um, 
Okay, today we are going to answer the question, who is my mission? I get it that I'm supposed to share how God's goodness has um, in, um, in, 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 inserted it with my life, but, or interacted with my life, but I do just walk up to random people and start talking? Uh, do I wear a sign that says, Jesus saves, look at me, you know, on the street corner? How do we do this? How do we do this? Because listen, <laughs> I think I'm not going to judge the guy on the street corner who's naked except with a sign, okay? I'm not going to judge him. Maybe that's where the Lord wants him. But listen, I, I have been in workplaces. I have been around people that uh, are so pushy and have no tact whatsoever about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ that embarrasses me. Right? They're just, they, 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 uh, you know, even as a Christian, sitting listening, it's like, man, I, if I think you're mocking my Lord, what do you think they think you're doing? You know? How do we do this? Who do we do this to? Listen, if God has uniquely placed me in some people's lives to share about Him, how do I go about identifying that? How do I know? We talked this morning, Eli's anniversary of his passing is coming up in November. And uh, I'd said at the funeral, I don't understand why this had to happen. The Word says all things work together for the good, for, for those who love Him. And we definitely have loved Him. Didn't know, didn't see it. I've shared this with you lots. A year into the deal, my baby sister got saved at my son's funeral. Her husband got saved. Their, their daughter is saved. There is a family tree that's been altered. There was something that come out of that. I didn't see it, didn't understand it, but it happened. Today I can have conversations with the Lord. Wasn't there a better way? Isn't there a different way? But who else had a conversation similar with the Lord? Saying, Lord, if there's another way, uh, take this cup from me. And I just have to, and Joel just has to accept the fact, like Jesus accepted the fact, that no, there wasn't another way. Okay? My little sister, you know, there was over 600 people at that funeral. I do not know how many lives were touched for the good that God was working in. Because uh, it, was, it wasn't even a funeral. It was a party. We sent our son off celebration. There was tears. But man, we rocked that house down. God was glorified that day. And he was honored. And uh, I think we sent, sent Eli out, out, out great. Listen, I believe with all my heart that today's topic is, is, is a major theme in Jesus' life. In fact, it's impossible. Listen to me, people. Okay? Okay. I think this is true. You can debate me later, but just not right now. In fact, it's impossible to truly be a follower of Jesus and ignore what we're talking about today. You know, we've, if, you guys know, man, I've come from, from the AA world and, and all this counseling, but one of the things that they said that I think holds fast to Christianity if you want to keep what you got, you got to give it away. They would say, Dallas, if you want to stay sober, then you got to give it away. You got to go find and help somebody else get sober. Christian, if you're here today, I think that it's our duty. Our duty. Look the word up. Duty. As a believer, to, uh, to make sure that we're discipling somebody. To make sure that we are sharing the good news with somebody. You know, however that might going to look in your life. Okay? This isn't, this isn't undercover Christianity. There's, there's really no such thing. Uh, it's called deception. It's called being deceived. Okay? And if there's people here who are, who are just new in this, this, this the, in this series, this guy's huge on talking to, to people who are new into, into, this, into the faith, you need to get this right away. Okay, this is what it's about, is equipping ourselves so we can go out and share the good news, to share what God has done in your life. 
Now listen, I know pretty much all of you is here. And you all have every reason to be skipping out this door to, I, I, into other people's lives and saying, Woo, want to know why I'm so happy? If we skipped out this door with, with truly understanding whose we are and, and, and what we've been given and what we got, you know what? You won't have to ask somebody if they want to know why you're so happy because they're going to come and ask you. What's different about you? You know what? That little town in New Plymouth, when we first got saved, I don't know what it was, but people had asked us several times on the, road, on the streets, at the post office, at the bank, man, why is you and your kids always so smiley? Why do you guys always got a smile on your face? Why are you always so happy? I didn't realize we were. I wanted to trade a couple of the kids off generally all the time. <laughs> Don't know how I could get my wife to comply. <laughs> but other people seen something in us that we didn't even see. What they seen was the Holy Spirit. What they seen was Jesus working in our lives. And they wanted to know about that. How do you do that? And you tell people, that's, what I, that's when I decided that I would stop telling people I'm a Baptist. Because you tell people you're a Baptist and right away they're like, oh, you're one of those. So what we started doing is we telling people, no man, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you know what? I'm probably going to disappoint you today, but I'll try to do better tomorrow. And I'm going to forgive you for when you disappoint me. I'm going to be better. You're going to be better. Listen, we all have, have every reason to skip out of this, out of this place in shining just like that. We should have, people should be coming up to us and say, man, what do you got this glow? What do you, what do you, how do you shine like this? You know, only one way. It sure is it because I come out to San Hollow Baptist Church. No way. I, I crawl into Jesus' arms every morning best I can. Read his word. Do the very best to, to do what he says. Do I do it wrong all the time? No. Probably fail more times than not, but, but I still keep getting up and doing it every day. And every day. And every now and then I accidentally do something right. And every now and then I accidentally can answer that person's question right. Who says, why are you smiling? You know what? After I become a pastor for a few years, that's what I tell them. They say, why are you so happy? Well, I'm a pastor. Oh, okay. You have to stop telling them that. You get paid to be happy. <laughs> so not very much. <coughs> it's impossible to truly be a follower of Jesus and ignore what we're talking about today. In John 2, 24 and 25, it says, But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for they knew all pe for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Listen, Jesus knew all people, and Jesus knows all people, and he knows what is inside them. And he started his ministry. As he started his ministry, he gives us two popular oppos or polar opposite examples of the kinds of people that God loved to work in. Listen to the next verse in John 3, 1. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. We're not going to talk about Nicodemus today, but we could spend months talking about Nicodemus and his encounter with Jesus, that's for sure. Jesus has a conversation with a very religious man named Nicodemus. We're not going to study this conversation today, except to say that the author, John, very deliberately placed this conversation before the scene we're going to read about. Um, Jesus has a spiritual conversation with someone you'd expect to have it all figured out, right? Like a pastor of the church. Nicodemus was somebody in his, in his, in his, uh, in his community. But listen, but he ends up correcting some basic beliefs that Nicodemus was holding. Jesus, this is what I think found is funny throughout the whole gospel. All my, all my pastor friends have said, would say to me, man, wouldn't it be so cool if Jesus just showed up and, and, and pulled up a chair or sit down and have a talk with us? I said, man, for what I've gathered from the scriptures, 
I don't want Jesus to take all the church leaders and pull up a chair and have a chat with us because we're about fixing to get a licking. There wasn't one church leader who didn't get a licking in the Bible, right? But he does come talk to church leaders. And I've had people come and talk to me. I've had people come and talk to me and say, well, pastor, you said that you believe this, but this is what the Bible says. I've had a change. Right? I'm not, I'm not, I'll have to change. So, but anyways, Jesus, Jesus spoke with Nicodemus. Just because someone appears to be a super Christian doesn't mean that they're not still struggling with questions about their faith. Um, Jesus leaves there and has a profound conversation with a woman. Jesus makes an important point to her. And listen to this point that he's, that he's making. And see if you can see it as we read through this account. No one is off limits when it comes to talking about God. Okay? No one is off limits when it comes to talking about God. We had some people in the hot tub who I thought, I was waiting for him to witness to me in Joe Allen. But all he did about four times was tell me how him and his wife didn't, don't have a TV in their house. We don't believe in TVs. Okay? I was waiting. Don't believe in TVs. So I witnessed to him. I figured, what the heck, man? If he's not going to do it, I'll do it. You know? Then I started hogging the conversation so they wanted to talk to the ladies. No one is off limits when it comes to talking about the Lord. All right, let's go to uh, the next slide, I think. Um, okay, the next one. Okay, the next one. Here we are. And if you have your Bibles, open to, to John chapter 4. This is where we'll be at this morning. And, uh, and you can read along with me if you want. It says, When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, verse 3, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria. <coughs> Can you hit the next one? Okay. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sinchar, I think that's how you say it, Sinchar, near the uh, property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. Um, you know, ge geography helps us understand this passage a little bit. Uh, we read that he left Judea to go to Galilee. Now, most Jews would have actually make this trip longer than they would have to by intentionally missing Samaria. The Jewish people despised the Samaritans because they saw them as sellouts. Uh, they were the people that, which I thought was funny because Matthew was sort of a sellout. Everybody thought he was... He was, anyways, that's a different deal. They, they were the people that intermarried with the people of the land so that they were only half Jewish. Hmm. We talked a little bit about racism today in Sunday school, and it seemed like that there's a pretty popular sense man. Uh, what's interesting is that Jesus actually went out of his way to go through Samaria. Okay? He was on a mission. He was on a mission. The scene we're about to read is the only scene we read during this trip, meaning it must be incredibly significant. Him going through Samaria, him going to this well, he did it for a reason. There, he, he just didn't stumble on the well and thought, oh, okay. He was headed somewhere intentionally, wasn't he? Jesus sits down at the well by himself. We'll learn later that, this, that his disciples have gone into town to grab some food. Okay, so let's go to 7, let's read verses 7 through 14. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her. Honey, he didn't say please. <laughs> because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, asked for a drink from me, the Samaritan woman? A Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, 
you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman in verse 11, uh, verse 11, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? Uh, you, aren't, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He, he gave us the well and drank from it himself and did his sons and livestock, as did his sons and livestock. Verse 13, Jesus says, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. All right. As we seek to answer this question, who's my mission? I think it's interesting how the different people in this scene apparently saw this woman. Okay? Um, how the Samaritan woman saw herself. How did she see herself? She came at noon. She was full of shame over her past. She, she, she didn't associate with all the other ladies. So she didn't think much of her own self, did she? And how did the disciples saw her? Listen to this. Uh, wait, where, uh, or wait where are they are. <laughs> okay. The disciples passed this woman going to town, most likely. Never said a word to her, did they? She's a Samaritan. Okay, they're Jews. Okay. Uh, never said a word to her. So they, they, they passed her by on the way. Never talked to her when they returned. Okay, how did Jesus see her? How did Jesus see her? One, Jesus saw, listen to me, Chris, you don't have to go because this is important. She was worth it. Jesus saw this woman was worth it. She was worth it. Do you look at people and see their worth? Or do we look at people and see our differences? See their shortcomings? See how they don't really measure up? Listen, Jesus looked at this woman and thought that she was worth it. She was worth going out of his way to meet her. He was worth crossing social barriers. She was worth it. Number two, she was, she was persistent. This woman was persistent. Okay? You might say, where do you see her, her persistence? Um, check out what happens in verses 15 to 18. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. For you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Go ahead and click it. Okay. <clears throat> I've heard many, many sermons focusing on this woman. And, the, and I've even preached them before. On how this woman was an adulteress. She had, had been married all these times. Had all this all this sin in her life. And, and, uh, but you know what? I've missed something. And I want you to, to correct me if, 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 you, if you think I might be wrong. But uh, in the first century Middle Eastern culture, it was a man-centered world. Okay, you can go to the Middle East today and it's a man-centered world. Okay? Women were seen as second-class citizens. And men had all the power. See, this wasn't the tramp down the road who just get bored, okay? This wasn't, this, this was a woman who possibly, right, possibly, uh, listen, it was completely acceptable for a man to have several premarital sexual relations, and if a husband wanted to divorce his wife, all he had to do was give her a certificate and kick her to the curb, so he could come home from work not like that. He had to hang the, the clothes out on the line himself. Make her available. Get out. You're done. Okay? And in that culture, she'd had to go. She would have to go. And she was marked. You notice? They, they don't say anything about the guy here. Just the girl. She marked. 
So this isn't a woman that jumps around from guy to guy. I, I'm, I'm really thinking that, that she wasn't. This wasn't a woman who jumped around from guy to guy. This is probably a woman who has been used and abused over and over by, by multiple men. She knows. She knows what it's like to feel pain and to feel loss. She probably is carrying some bitterness and angry, anguish, or anger along with her, with her shame and her loneliness. Yet, here she is. She's not giving up. Okay, she's still going to the well. She's still day after day going out and getting water. <coughs> Maybe someone else missed something that Jesus saw because he knew what was inside her. Just like he knew and knows what's inside each of you. This becomes obvious later in the story. Check out the best part. Let's look at verses 39 through 42. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and they stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said and they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. Getting through it. You know what? The very next verse says that Jesus left for Galilee after two days. So he goes out of his way because he sees this woman's worth it. She gets excited. She runs to town. And tells everybody, hey, you got to come and meet this guy. And this is a woman who says to everybody, hey, come and meet this guy who have shunned her, have belittled her, have shamed her because, because of who she is. But she, she said, you got to come. Has that ever happened to you when you have the, a moment with the Lord, an experience with the Lord? It's like, man, you got to come and check this out. You will never believe me. You've got to see it for yourself. Even more amazing to me that they went. So there is an important spiritual revival among the Samaritans that goes on for two days. How does it happen? The very woman that people had cast aside comes back into the village of people that had rejected her and convinces them to meet her new friend and Savior, Jesus. I don't picture her ha am handing out a few flyers because of who she was. It couldn't have, um, couldn't have been easy. Listen, this couldn't have been easy for her to do. She pleaded with the people, though, to come meet the man who told her everything she had ever done. She wouldn't take no for an answer. How many times do you think she went back into town over those two days to convince them again to meet Jesus? She is one special lady and one of the most surprising and dynamic leaders in the whole New Testament, if you really think about it. She was lost, then she got found. And you know what? It wasn't enough for her to have it. She wanted you to be found. She wanted you to have the living water springing up in you. That's a pretty special person. Think about this. This was the very woman that the disciples passed by without ever saying a word to. This was also the very same people that the disciples had seen when they walked into the village to buy food. <coughs> it never crossed their mind to share with them Yet this woman sees people that desperately needed to meet her Savior. To meet their Savior. <clears throat> I want you to listen to this. Uh, it's really short little by Tony Campolo. And uh, just listen to this with, with me if you will. A new recruit went into the training at Paris Island hoping to become a Marine. 
He was one of those young men who seemed to be a bit out of step with, with the norm. And he easily became the subject of ridicule for those who enjoyed picking on uh, offbeat people. In the particular barracks to which this young man or this young Marine was assigned, there was an extremely high level of meanness. The other young men did everything they could to make a joke of the new recruit and to humiliate him. One day, someone came up with the bright idea that they would scare the daylights out of this young Marine by dropping a disarmed hand grenade onto the floor and pretending it was about to go off. Everyone else knew about this and they were all ready to get a big laugh. The hand grenade was thrown into the middle of the floor, and the warning was yelled, It's a live grenade! It's a live grenade! It's about to explode! They fully expected that the young man would, would get hysterical and perhaps jump out a window. Instead, the young Marine fell on the grenade, hugged it to his stomach, and yelled to the other men in the barracks, Run for your lives! Run for your lives! You'll be killed if you don't! The other Marines froze in stillness and shame, as they should. They realized that the one they had scorned was the one ready to lay down his life for them. <clears throat> and so it was with Jesus. So it was with this woman. You have no idea what's inside people. Uh, so who is your mission? I think Jesus was teaching multiple lessons to multiple audiences here. Jesus primarily focused on... Uh, <coughs> focus was on making disciples, so he used every scenario to teach them a lesson in ministry. The first lesson doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. While all are called to share their faith, there are certain people that have the gift of evangelist. My guess is that Jesus desired everyone to, to, of his disciples to have this gift. He would, he would hand the keys to them a few years later af, um, after he went back to heaven. So, he was, um, so it was huge. They would go on to, to spread the gospel, but had to learn this lesson. Who is my mission? Ladies and gentlemen, everybody is your mission. Everybody's your mission. If you found that you have a relatively easy time sharing your faith with other people, then it is a good chance that you have the spiritual gift of evangelism. If you've seen God use you to reach a number of people, there is a good shot. God has given you this gift. Maybe you've never shared your faith, but God has made you an influencer in other areas of your life. And with the right training, you could have this gift too. Listen, evangelists see opportunities that other people don't. Okay? They are able to move ordinary conversations into ones that bring up the gospel. Sharing their faith is not a duty they feel guilty about, but as a delight they love to do every chance they get. We talked about Miss Shirley W. today. Miss Shirley W. Uh, was a special lady. Okay? She's a special lady. And we were there when her husband passed away. Uh, Richard Cook and I went up that afternoon and prayed. First time in how many years that, that, that uh, her husband would... When I said, hey, do you want us to pray with, for you and with you? And he said, Yes. You know what? Four hours after that, he had a major heart, a major heart attack and was dead. And, and Miss Shirley calls us up to the hospital. Joel and I go up to the hospital. When we get there, Miss Shirley's in the room crying. Everybody who walked through those doors, Miss Shirley's one. She's stopping them, looking them right in the eye and said, Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? Some people thought, well, she was hysteric. No, Shirley wants to make sure you know who Jesus is. In, in the, man, in the, I know when Eli passed away, you know when Eli passed away, what my first thought was, was Lord, if, if, if you want me to give up one of my sons for them, no. No. I love you people, but no. Right? Not Miss Shirley. She wanted to make sure. 
at all costs. Do you know who Jesus is? Now, a lot of people think that she's a nut. And she is kind of goofy. But man, she's a sweet goofy. She's a loving, she's a genuine goofy. I mean, I don't know how if anybody who's met her and had her look you in the eyes and point that finger. Now, Dallas, do you know Jesus? If you didn't know Jesus, by the time she's done, you're going to. Many of you are thinking, well, I'm pretty sure that I don't have any kind of gift. I used to tell people that too. My gift is to not share my gift. That's my gift. Okay? Well, I'm pretty sure that I don't have that gift, so I'm off the hook, right? (laughs) The lesson we learn from Jesus to the Samaritan woman is, God has strategically listened to me. God has strategically placed you where you're at to reach some or um, to reach one or some, okay? Maybe it's one person, one person in your neighborhood. I appreciate the fact that you're not afraid to come up and talk to somebody that you ain't never met before about, about the Lord. That's how it works, okay? It's kind of like the nut on the, 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 the guy that has the, hey, uh, I, um, I, I need a ride, I need some gas money. Got 10 bucks? Okay, most of the time, I, I just drive by. Okay, because, and even if we stop and look at them, I completely can stop and look at them and say, ooh, yeah, I've been where you're at, it stinks, don't it? And drive off. But there's other times that I've stopped right up next to them and I hear the Lord speak to me as clearly as I'm speaking to you right now and He says, give this man some money. Say something to this man. Say a kind word. Be gentle. Okay, and... That's when, we, that's when we move, man. That's when we move. You will feel it. The Holy Spirit will lead you into to it. And you're, well, I don't know what to say. Don't worry about it. Because the Holy Spirit will do the talking. Most of the times when I'm doing the talking, all I can do is confuse everybody, man. When I just shut my mouth and let the Lord speak, things happen. Things happen. But that's how we share our faith. That's how we share our hope. <laughs> he's he's going to be up here one day. At least we know he's got the lungs for it. Notice this woman goes back to town where she was from. It probably was out of her comfort zone, but she felt compelled to share with those who, who, who she did life with. That's the dick ticket, folks. Let's share our faith with those that, who we do life with, whoever the Lord has put you in, in, in a sphere. And we've all got our own little, our own little world or fear, sphere or whatever you want to call it. We all know people who need to hear. And even if we have said, said something before, we can keep, we can keep saying it by uh, loving them. Loving them. By loving them. Um, there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff in here about, about the household. Who, who gets saved? There's like 50 verses that talk about the household gets saved. And you can consider your household where you work, your home, extended family. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I can't help it. I, I can't help it. And I, and I couldn't help it. People said, well, that's because you're a preacher. No, I couldn't help it before I was a preacher. And like with her cousins. I didn't know that they, they were all saved. But man, I was going to make sure. Because they had some issues. And you know what? I, I know one way. that Becoming a Christian isn't a fix-all to all. But it's a really good place to start. To get things all worked out. So I want to make sure that they, that they have them. I want to make sure the guy in the hot tub have them. I want to make sure you have them. I want to make sure your kids have it. One of the most staggering things for me is we had a wanna, and we had this young man in here who's grow up in the church. I want you to hear me. Okay, he grew up in the church, and he he was he's a smart kid, and he had that Bible memorized, all those verses to win. He's real competitive too. All those verses he has them memorized. Sit down, and ask him one night about a verse, John three sixteen. What's that mean to you, John? Chirp, 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 chirp. 
No idea what it meant. And I said, John, have you ever asked Jesus to, to be, come into your heart? To be the Lord of your life? I go get his mom. And I'm like, man, has John ever accepted Jesus? And his mom says to me, we never thought of that. He just, we take him to church. He knows the Bible verses. And Romans is pretty clear. Okay? We confess with our mouth. Believe in our heart. It's important that somebody confesses that I, yeah, I'm a Christian. I need Jesus. Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. Change my life. We need that. Your family needs that. Your neighbors need that. Okay? It doesn't matter, doesn't matter if they go to the resource room or not. They need it. It doesn't matter if they're the lawyer. They need it. Our president of the United States needs this message. Needs somebody to come up and share hope. Who's our mission? Everybody. Now that don't mean, again, that we've got to go out and act like a nut down on the corner throwing dollar bills away. But it means that we get in tune with the Spirit. You listen to the Lord. Was well, he going to come and say, hey, Dallas, do this? He might. But it's generally just a nudge, isn't it? It's generally just a nudge. Hey, be kind to that guy right now. You don't know what's going on in anybody's life. But God does. That's why he puts you where you're at. Remember when we went through Ruth? Is it possible that you could be put here for just a moment like this? Okay, there's no accidents. There's no accidents. Here's the, you know what? If you want to write that down, that's great. This is just an easy way to have, okay, when you ask who's my mission, this guy says, think of France. Friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, and listen, keep your eyes open. And keep your heart uncluttered so you can hear. You can hear where you can maybe be part of I don't know if any of y'all have ever been a part of it, but there is nothing more, more gracious and more rewarding, more energizing, more, I don't even know the right word. I've done a lot of drugs in my days, but there is nothing compared to when you take someone who's broken, lost, full of shame, full of hate, and bring them to the, to, to the feet of Jesus, and you just see they become a, a new creation. Right before your eyes. Being a part of that is a huge privilege. Huge privilege. And uh, that privilege is yours. It's what you've been called for. You know, we grew up in, a, in an era, and I don't know how it happened, but, we, I mean, out here anyways, a lot of people for years thought that, whoa, yeah, I got my, my friend Bob. He, he, need, he needs to get saved, so I'm going to bring him to the church. Well, that's great. Bring him to church. But, but you know, uh, if the Lord put Bob in your life, the pastor is not necessarily the one to lead him to the Lord. That's your job. That's your job. And there are, we got him. We've got him. You, you go ahead and, and hit the next uh, slide for me. I'm going to close right now. But this is what I would like to ask you. I'm going to challenge you guys. And I'm going to start having this in the bulletin. I didn't put it in here this morning. I'd like to challenge you guys to start praying with Joe Allen and I. Let's give, it, let's give it 90 days. Pray with me every day and Joe Allen for 90 days. Incorporate in your prayer. Lord, I don't ask you for much today. But would you give me your heart for the lost? Would you give me your heart for the lost? Would you pray that prayer with me? for the next 90 days. And let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I have an idea what will happen. If you do this faithfully, in about day, about day 30, you're going to be able to write down some names of people who you know that the Lord has wanted you to visit with. And then you'll be able to pray for them. Lord, have, them, have their hearts open to receive the message to receive the conversation. Oh Lord, give me an opportunity to step out in faith 
and, and trust you and share the good news with whoever. I, I'm telling you, I have seen I mean, with the men used to meet in that room, the library, where the high school kids meet now. You guys are all, everybody who comes to this church in the last, in the last 15 years, you've been prayed here by men who love the Lord and who love one another. And we, we, we every, faithfully, every week, we came in here and prayed. And we prayed. And we prayed. And we've seen our lives change. Listen, if you join me in this prayer, you'll see a change. The Lord will show up in a mighty way. And who knows? You might not see it, Sarah. We might do all this and never see that fruit. But we might. We might. Even when you water your garden every day, one day that seed turns into a plant. And if you aren't out there watering it, you ain't going to see that. Bow your heads, please. Father God, thank you. Thank you for loving us enough to give us a purpose. It's just not to, to eat, drink, and to be merry. For tomorrow we'll die. Lord, you give us a, a purpose to, uh, to share our experience, our strength, and our hope in you with those who are, who are hopeless, with those who are, who are down. We don't know you. Father, we pray for all the people who you're going to bring into our lives. But the, t today, our prayer is to you, is Lord, is that we don't ask for much today, but would you give me your heart for the lost? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.